thank you for joining me here today at Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations. My name is Laura, and today I am talking about All of Us Strangers, directed by Andrew Hay, released in 2023, and I'm comparing it with the book Strangers by Tachi Yamada, released in 1987. And this movie is currently streaming on Hulu, so if you already have a Hulu account, this is included in that. And I highly recommend the movie. If you have not yet seen the movie, you should definitely go see it now, and it's best to go into it knowing as little as possible. So go watch the movie, and then once you have finished it, come back here and watch this video, because I'm just gonna get into spoilers right off the bat. And I would recommend the book as well. I really liked that too. It is harder to find. I actually had to buy this one off of eBay so it's not available on Kindle and it wasn't even available to buy a physical copy on Amazon like I had to go to eBay <laughs> to find it so I was kind of surprised by that but regardless if you are able to buy this book for yourself it is one I recommend and then to get right into the story so our main character has a different name from book to film the movie takes place in England whereas the book takes place in Japan and so in the book our main character's name is Haido whereas in the movie his name is Adam and in the book Haido is a 47 almost 48 year old screen writer and he has recently gotten divorced and he has one son who is in college and he is the one who suggested the divorce because he felt like he and his wife were just in a loveless marriage but then like once he was able to convince his wife she kind of is a bit too happy and then at their divorce proceedings she's like oh I'm so glad you suggested this and so he's just even though he suggested the divorce he is kind of struggling with this and then because finances are tight due to the divorce he had to move into his office and so he is living in this building that is busy during the day because because people work there but then at night it is just empty and quiet and there is only one other person who lives in the building full-time and it is a woman named Kay and then also early on in the book a guy so like I said he is a screenwriter for like tv shows primarily and early on in the book this guy who has hired him in the past and they've just worked together a lot through the years he comes to visit Haido and he tells him that they can no longer work together because he wants to start dating Haido's ex-wife whereas in the movie Adam again he is a you know man in his late 40s who is a screenwriter except here he is gay and there is no ex-wife and there is no son and then also the building he lives in it's just a new apartment building and because it's so new and in this weird part of town I guess that is why it is so empty and it is just him and one other person and in this movie the other person is a man named Harry and in the movie Adam is working on a script about his childhood and his parents so we see him kind of going through different things from his childhood whereas in the book he is writing an unrelated script that has nothing to do with himself or his parents and then in both book and movie, one night when our main character, Adam slash Haido, he is just alone in his apartment. When the other tenant shows up at his door and they are drunk, they just say how like they're lonely and it's so quiet here and they just want some company. But Adam slash Haido just is not interested and he's pretty cold to them and he just tells them to go away basically. And then shortly after this interaction with his fellow tenant, he then decides that he wants to visit, Haido slash Adam decides he wants to visit his hometown. And like I said in the movie, he has been writing about his parents and kind of going through different photographs and that is what makes him decide to go visit his old childhood home whereas in the book it is his 48th birthday and he goes to a department store to buy himself a tie but he's lying and he's saying he's buying it as a birthday present present for someone else and the whole interaction just makes him feel so depressed and lonely and so when he is walking home with this tie he bought for himself he sees a train going towards his hometown his childhood hometown and he randomly just decides to hop on and in both we learn that his parents had died when he was 12 and so this home town he is visiting and he lived up until he was 12 because then after that he went to go stay with different relatives and in the book his parents had died when his mom was pregnant she and the husband had been riding on a bike to get somewhere when they were hit by a car and died whereas in the movie his parents had gone out to a Christmas party and they had been drinking and then while driving home they hit like black ice and they died and the father died instantly however the mom she stayed alive for a few days in the hospital before dying and later in the movie there's a part where Adam tells Harry about the death of his parents and Harry expresses like his sincere sympathies at hearing about this and Adam replies being like oh you know it's fine it was a long time ago but then Harry says yeah like I don't think that matters <laughs> right and I thought this was just such a beautiful scene and such a powerful line too but in both when he is walking around his hometown he ends up coming across a man 
who looks exactly like his father did when he was at the age that he died. And in both, this man gets our main character's attention and then invites him back home. And in the book, you know, this man takes Haido back to the apartment that Haido had grown up in and the woman there looks just like his mom. But throughout this first interaction, none of them address who they are. Although he does refer to them as mom and dad, <laughs> but they just like aren't phased and they just go along with it. And he assumes that they are just a really friendly couple who maybe are lonely and they are just like, just so open and kind because he just logically is like, they can't possibly be my parents, right? And so he is finding other explanations. And it isn't until his second visit when he goes back and it is just the mom there. And while he is with her, he's like, oh, by the way, I never asked what your name was. And the mom replies saying something like, she laughs and she's like, what? Like my own son is asking me my name. And this is when he realizes like, wow, like these really are my parents. And so then he just proceeds to go back and visit them time and time again. And it's interesting because he, he sees a side of his parents he never saw when he was a child, right? Because when you're a kid, you know, there's just like your parents are more complex than you realize. And so he just sees more to them. But also he just keeps going back because he just feels such a sense of security and love. And his parents just kind of hang out. They eat, they play card games, they watch TV. We get a part where he and his dad just toss a ball back and forth. And so it's just really wholesome, sweet things that he does when he's there with them. And a detail when he visits them the first time and they're saying things like, oh, come again. Like we, we loved having you here, you know, just different nice things like that as they're leaving. And when he's on the taxi ride home, he keeps repeating these phrases and he even repeats them out loud. And the taxi driver is like, I mean, can you stop? <laughs> you know, he's so lonely. And so as he's on his way home, even when he's not really sure they're his parents or not, he just keeps repeating these words that his parents had told him, you know? But once they acknowledge that they are his parents, during different visits, he will get them to teach him a card game that he does not know how to play because he's like, if they can like actually teach me the real rules to this card game, that proves that they aren't a figment of my imagination because I genuinely don't know how to play this game. So if suddenly I learn it, then clearly they're real. Whereas in the movie, right away, the parents are talking about him being their son. And so there is no moment of him guessing as to who these people are because right away they're talking about childhood memories. And during the second visit, he goes to visit and it is just his mom, kind of like how it had been in the book. But in the movie, the mom asks him like, oh, like, so do you have a girlfriend? And this is when he tells her like, no, I, I don't have a girlfriend because I'm gay. And the mom had died in the 80s when it was, you know, a very different time. And so she is coming at it from that perspective. And so he keeps trying to tell her, you know, as she is asking different questions and saying different things, he keeps trying to explain to her like, no, like that's not the way it is. And that's not the way the world is now. Like things have changed and they are like trying to bond, but then she'll say something that just, you know, that hurts him. And at one point she tells him, you know, like I've heard it's a lonely life. And he tells her like, no, like it's not like that anymore. And she says, oh, so you're not lonely. And he is lonely though, right? And so he's like, well, if I am lonely, it's not because I'm gay. But then he eventually leaves. And when he returns again, he talks with his dad and the mom has told the dad by this point. And so they talk about it. And the dad says how like he wasn't surprised and he could like always kind of tell when Adam was a kid. He asks if Adam was bullied in school and Adam is like, yeah, I was. And then he's like, yeah, it doesn't surprise me because sometimes I heard you crying after school in your room. And Adam is like, if you heard me crying, like, why didn't you comfort me? But then the dad is like, well, why didn't you tell me what was happening at school? <laughs> and Adam is like, no, you answer first. And the dad says how basically he didn't want to, like he had his suspicions and he didn't want to face the reality of the situation. And so that is why he never had the courage to go and comfort his son. And he also acknowledges that if he had been Adam's age, he would have been one of the boys that would have bullied Adam. And he also apologizes because he's like, man, like we would make so many jokes, like make fun of different gay people around you. And he's realizing how much that must have hurt Adam. And as they're talking about these painful things, Adam then is like, you know, I have positive memories too. And then the dad asks if he can hug Adam. And so then they hug. And then we see in the reflection that Adam looks like a child being hugged, kind of like, you know, this is the hug and the attention he had wanted when he was a kid, but never received. And this scene was just so fantastic fantastic and I was feeling emotional <laughs> throughout this whole movie and then this scene happens and oh it 
uh, it was just so incredible and so emotional. But yeah, in the movie version, his parents are much more self-aware and they know that they are dead and they will ask questions like, oh, what happened afterwards? And they ask how they died and like, they're just very aware, right? Whereas in the book, none of this is ever acknowledged and the parents are just kind of acting like this is normal. And so Heido therefore also acts like this is normal. And in the movie, we're not sure if these are just figments of his imagination. It's kind of implied that it is his imagination Whereas in the book, other people interact with his parents and they, they are like legitimate ghosts and he isn't just making it up, which was really interesting. But yeah, and like I said, they just do like kind of sweet, wholesome activities together and we never see them have quite as deep of conversations as we see them have in the movie. But also in the book, there is an interesting part. Like I said, there's an evening where he tosses the ball back and forth with his dad and he's remembering how they only did this once when he was growing up. And in the book we read, I wanted so badly to play catch with him, but he'd always made excuses that he was too busy. Until finally, just that once, he agreed to play with me. He was all wrapped up in the league he belonged to with his sushi shop buddies, and he didn't put a high priority on playing catch with his son. And the fact that his parents aren't a figment of his imagination in the book, I thought that was an interesting element because it's kind of like the parents getting an opportunity to be there for him a bit more, right? Like ju just then we read how playing catch with his son wasn't a priority when he was alive. But now that he's here getting the chance to be around his son again, he's wanting to do better, essentially. Whereas like I said in the movie, it definitely seemed like it's all in his imagination, but I feel like it's up to your interpretation. But we need to return to Harry slash Kay, the fellow tenant in this empty building he lives in because shortly after, so he, so we have the night where they come to his door drunk. And then soon after this is when he starts seeing his parents again. And then during this time he sees Harry slash K in the building and they apologize being like, oh, like, sorry about the other night when I was drinking. Like that was embarrassing. And he basically tells them like, oh, like, don't worry about it. And we should, we should meet up sometime. And so from here in both book and movie, he begins a relationship with this person. And also in both Harry slash K is 50 15 to 20 years younger than our main character. And in the book, this kind of comes up with this age gap they have. But in the movie, it seems like it was something that was focused on a bit more, partly because they're both gay men, but because they have this generational gap, their experiences were different. And so I just thought this brought about some really interesting conversations between the two of them. But yeah, so in the movie, at one point during the relationship, he tells Harry that he wants to go out to a club with him. And so they go out and Harry has a drug that Adam assumes is cocaine cocaine, but it ends up being ketamine. And so he's like, oh, like I've never done this before. And so we then get this like trippy dreamlike sequence where we see him in the club. And then we see this montage of he and Harry's relationship. But then we return to the club and we see that that was just in Adam's imagination. And then we see him with his parents again, and it is Christmas. And we get this great scene where they're decorating a tree. And then his he's going to bed and he's begging his mom not to go to the Christmas party because going to a Christmas party is how they died. And yeah, the scene just keeps changing until eventually we see him wake up in his own bed with Harry and he's like, whoa, like what happened? And Harry tells him that he had been yelling out for his parents in the club. And so Harry brought him home. And then in the book, so again, he has a relationship with Kay and something with her is that she has this really bad burn on her chest that she refuses to let him see. And so he is, he never sees the front of her basically. And as he is seeing his parents, multiple people, including Kay, start telling him how he's just looking so worn out and tired and just like skin and bones and like he's aging rapidly. And so multiple people, people comment on this being like, are you okay, man? But then when Heido looks in the mirror, he looks fine. So he's like, what do you, what are people talking about? Like, I look fine. And so one night he's with Kay and he is not seeing what she is seeing. And so then she's hugging him. And as she's hugging him, she's kind of like praying to a higher power, being like, please help this man, like help this man see what is happening to him. And he has been telling her that he is seeing his parents, by the way. So she is aware that he's seeing his dead parents. And after she says this prayer, he then feels super weak. And when he looks in the mirror, he sees what other people see and the fact that he does look so sickly and terrible. And so he's like, oh my gosh. And so she tells him like, visiting your parents is killing you. Like this is what's happening because you're seeing them. You need to promise you will never see them again. He tells her that he just needs to see them one last time. And then he promises 
he will be done. And he's also just very touched that Kay cares so much about him. So his love for her is making him agree to stop seeing his parents, even though he loves seeing his parents and he doesn't want to stop. But to get to the book ending, so he goes to see his parents to tell them he can't see them anymore. And this is the first time they acknowledge that this isn't the usual setup, right? And that they are dead and that they are ghosts visiting him. And they decide to go dine out and, you know, says this is the last time they'll see each other. But again, as they're walking around town and going to the restaurant, other people are interacting with his parents. So again, they are really there and other people see them. But anyway, so then they go to a restaurant and the parents are telling him, you know, how proud they are and how they like loved being able to spend time with him again. And as they are praising him saying, you know, he's such a good guy and they're so proud of him, he then says, no, I'm not. I'm nothing like the man you two seem to think I am. I failed as a husband and wasn't much of a father either. You two are fine folk, not me. You're warm, so warm I was surprised. Everyone should have parents like you, my son included. And though I've played the devoted son with you, there's no telling how I might have treated you if, if you had lived all of these years. In my career, I've never produced anything truly great. I'm just a hack competing for... But then he cuts off because then his parents start to fade away as they are saying goodbye to him. And so th he has this experience and obviously he is just very emotionally drained and sad at having to see his parents leave him. And he returns to Kay and the two of them are spending time together and a certain amount of time passes when he comes across that colleague, the one that is now dating his ex-wife. He had seen him again, like accidentally when he had been seeing his parents and this guy had commented again, being like, wow, like, you look horrible. And so now it's been a while since he's seen his parents and this colleague shows up at his door and the colleague still says he looks terrible. And Heido, he's just like, wait, what? Like, how do I still look terrible? Mentally, he's thinking like, I haven't been seeing my parents. Like there's, I should be getting my health back. This doesn't make sense. And then this colleague tells him he saw Heido with Kay and he just had different weird interactions involving Kay where he was like, okay, something weird is happening. And he talks to the building manager and the building manager also sees Heido with Kay. And he says like, she looks exactly exactly like a woman who lived in this building who killed herself like six to eight weeks ago. She had stabbed herself and that lady looks exactly like her. And so basically there's some other details I'm leaving out, but essentially Kay is also a ghost and that is why Heido still looks so worn out and why he is still dying is because both Kay and his parents have kind of been taking life from him. His parents had been doing it unintentionally, but Kay is doing it intentionally. And so she is just like sucking the life out of Heido. After the colleague is telling him all of this. They then see Kay in the hallway and Heido, he doesn't have that same love for Kay anymore now that he knows the truth. And yet at the same time, he tells her like, you know, like, it's fine. <laughs> you can go ahead and take my life. Like, it's okay. However, Kay is really upset. And I guess because he doesn't have a genuine love for her, like she now can't take his life because of, you know, the ghostly signs behind it all. Like he has to love the person in order for them to take his life. And so even though he's saying like, you can go ahead and have it, she is no longer capable of it. And so she is very angry at him and like says mean things to him before she fades away. And then from here, Heido goes to a hospital where he is able to be rejuvenated again and get his health back. And then this experience also helps him make more of an effort with his own son. And then he also meets up with this colleague yet again. And this colleague, you know, he just thought of him as a colleague. With this experience, he's like, wow, like I really appreciate how much you cared about me <laughs> and the fact that you, you know, made such an effort, obviously, and he saved Heido's life. But as he is talking with this guy at the end, the guy, he is kind of not wanting to acknowledge what happened. And he's like, you know, what we were just crazy and you know because he told this guy about his parents and he's like yeah you were just kind of nuts you know like the thing with your parents didn't happen and the thing with Kay both of us were just seeing things that weren't there and let's just pretend we were both a little crazy and leave it at that whereas Heido he knows like internally that he wasn't crazy he was perfectly fine and that what happened really did happen but rather than being resentful you know he's not resentful towards his parents at all and he's also not resentful towards Kay and in the end he's just at peace and he is a better man now thanks to this experience with both his parents and Kay. And then to move on to the movie. So in the movie, he is with Harry and he wants Harry to meet his parents. And so he takes him to his childhood home and it's dark and he's knocking on the windows trying to, you know, get people to let him in. And Harry is like, 
uh, like your parents don't live here anymore. Like they're dead. Like, what are you doing? Like you're crazy. And so Harry is just very distraught at seeing Adam kind of going crazy. And then while Adam is knocking on the window, like the audience, we see his parents inside though. Like they're ghostly figures inside the house. And then he, Adam kind of blacks out. And when he comes to, he is inside and his parents are there and he hears them talking about how they need to put an end to this. And Adam can't keep seeing them. So this is different because in the book, Haida was the one saying like, this has to end. Whereas in the movie, the parents are the one that tell him like, you can't keep seeing us anymore. Like it's not good for your mental and emotional health. Like you need to be able to move on. And so like in the book, they go out to eat in order to make the most of this last interaction. And like in the book, they tell him how proud they are of him and how much they love him and how they have loved getting to know adult him. And again, it was just such a fantastic scene in the movie and so emotional. And as he is talking to them, they both fade away. And they also have a sweet moment where the mom and dad are talking to each other, like just saying how much they love each other and thanking each other for being there, which was also a really sweet moment. But also before they fade away, they tell him we like Harry. We could see him through the window last night and you know, he has a sad face, but he's very handsome and just, you know, like take care of him. And they also ask him if he is in love with Harry, but Adam says how like, I don't know, I've never been in love before. So I don't know what that even feels like. But after he says goodbye to his parents, he then goes back to the apartment building and he goes to Harry's apartment, which he has never seen before. And right when he walks in, like we can see that something is off and that there is a smell. And he goes in the bedroom and he sees the body of Harry who apparently overdosed because there were drugs too, but he had also been drinking, right? Because he was drunk when he came to the door. And so he sees that Harry had died that night, which the same with Kate. I don't know if I mentioned that, but yeah, she had killed herself that night after Heido rebuffed her. So in both cases, he had shut the door on this person and then they had gone and committed suicide. And it's interesting because in the book, Heido wonders about that afterwards. He's like, oh, I hope I wasn't too harsh. She seemed pretty distraught. Like what if she killed herself? But then he later sees her and is like, oh good, I don't need to worry about that. Uh, but yeah, so in the movie, he sees his body, but then he hears a noise in the living room. So then he goes out there and he sees Harry's ghost is there. And Harry's ghost is very distraught, you know, being like, oh, like I'm in there, aren't I? And he's like, it was that night. Like I just felt so lonely and I just needed to be around someone. And we also hear throughout the relationship earlier in the film. And obviously we don't know if this is real or Adam's imagination, but Harry had talked about how he wasn't close to his parents and how that had always been the case, but how throughout his life, he has just kind of continually gone further and further out to the edge of his family circle. But yeah, Adam tries to comfort Harry and then they go back up to Adam's apartment and then the movie ends with him, you know, they're just holding each other and then their image turns into a star in a constellation. And I read an article in Esquire, which I will link to, and of this ending, they say, the entire relationship between him and Adam was all a figment of Adam's imagination. Adam had been sixth sensing throughout the whole film, either as a mental breakdown, disassociating, or a coping mechanism for the deep-seated trauma he still feels from the loss of his parents as a child. The most maternal way Harry cared for Adam was when he had a fever, for example, was wish fulfillment on Adam's part. He wants a partner to care for him how his mother did, and he projected this role onto a fantasy version of Harry. But it doesn't end there. As Harry reappears in the same pink jumper he wore when he first visited Adam, he confirms that he's dead. I was so lonely that night, he explains mournfully. The pair head back to Adam's apartment. If this is the reality, Adam appears to reason he wants to continue the delusion and live in his fantasy world. He has said goodbye to his parents again, but he's not letting go of the ghost of Harry, who never truly existed in the real world relationship with Adam, and who seems to represent Adam's inability to move on in life and let people in. The past is where Adam wants to stay. Or he is stuck in purgatory and he is also dead as perhaps he has been right from the start. And as he cozies up to Harry on his bed, the ending gets cosmic. As the pair form a heart formation cuddled up to each other, a light begins to shine between them, which gets brighter as they recede into the blackness and other stars begin to shine beside them. As Frankie goes to Hollywood blares out, it's the power of love indeed, a force from above. And yeah, obviously a big theme of both book and movie are dealing and processing with grief and trauma. And in the book, when Haido, after he meets up with his parents, he is then thinking about the relationship with his wife. And we read, as I see it now, the perpetual stress I had been under since the age of 12 had rendered me woefully inept at accepting the goodwill of others. Those who go through healthy childhoods learn that exhibiting a suitable degree of dependence is how one gains others' love. But an unfortunate adolescence had deprived me of this secret and the deficiency had gradually placed a chill on my relationship with my wife. And yeah, because in the book, we learned that he kind of 
different family members took care of him. So he kind of moved around a lot after the death of his parents. And yeah, the fact that when a child goes through something so traumatic and if they're not able to process it in a healthy way, like, yeah, like they go into adulthood at such a disadvantage, right? But in the end, when he says goodbye to them, like, especially, I would say, especially in the book, because in the end of the book, Haido is doing better. And so by saying goodbye to his parents, he has been able to fully process this grief and this trauma. Whereas in the movie, you know, on top of the death of his parents, we have the added layer of Adam being gay in a time when the world was more homophobic. And so he has that added layer of trauma on top of something else. And then like the article says, you could wonder if Adam has come to a better place because he said goodbye to his parents. And he did have some really healing conversations with them, right? So in some ways it was a healing experience as a way for him to process what he didn't get to experience in childhood and in adulthood due to the death of his parents. But then the fact that in the end of the movie, he's not willing to say goodbye to Harry. He's just moving from one unhealthy coping mechanism with his parents onto another unhealthy coping mechanism by not willing to let go of Harry and to move on with his life in the real world. Assuming he is alive, he could potentially be dead this whole time. In the movie, Adam only interacts with Harry and his parents. We, I don't think we ever see him talk to anybody else. And so there's that question too, where it's like, has he just been dead this whole time? But when it comes to book versus movie, so I was halfway through the book when I had the chance to go see this movie in theaters and the ending, when we find out that Harry has been dead the whole time, I, it felt like we were being kicked while we were down, right? Because this movie has been so emotional and he just had to say goodbye to his parents. And now we find out the devastating fact that Harry had killed himself that night. Yeah, I just had not been expecting that. And like I said, the ending of the movie is very ambiguous. I would love to hear what your thoughts are. Comment down below, letting me know. But it's interesting because usually movies have a concrete ending, whereas books tend to be more ambiguous. But like the character of Haido, uh, Taichi Yamada, he was a screenwriter. And so I wonder if the way he ties things up neatly in the end kind of reflects the fact that he usually wrote for TV where they do want things tied up a bit nicer, you know? So I thought that was interesting. Whereas yeah, the movie leaves you with a lot of questions. And by the way, the author Taichi Yamada, he passed away in November of 2023. So rest in peace. And also this book has been adapted before in 1988. It was made into a Japanese movie called The Discarnates. I kind of did a brief Google search. I don't know if that's available to stream. It seems like it might be hard to find, but if I'm able to find it, it would be interesting to watch that. But yeah, the movie, it takes out the aspect of seeing these ghosts, you know, it's killing the main character. We don't see that in the movie. We don't even know for sure if they're ghosts, but the movie has the added element, like I've said, of Adam being gay and how that is a huge part of this story, right? Like his relationship with Harry, but also him being able to have these conversations with his parents and his parents being able to just really see who he is and who he has become. And uh, it was just so beautiful and so powerful. This is one of those adaptations that I love because the director put so much of themselves into the story. And so they made changes from the source material, but the changes they made reflect their own experience, you know? And so clearly Andrew Hay read this book and it resonated with him and he found it compelling and he just injected himself into the story and is like, you know, how would this be for myself? Because Andrew Hay is a gay man. And yeah, I just, I love when directors do that. I talked about it with Steven Spielberg and Catch Me If You Can, as well as Tim Burton with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And those changes I am totally on board with because it's not a change that was made in order to make this more of a crowd pleaser or, you know, it's all about money. Instead, it was a change that meant something to the creator, to the director. And so it just made it more personal for them. And so that's what I love, right? Like they took an existing story that meant something to the author and then they combined it with their own story and turned it into its own thing that is just so beautiful and powerful. And, and yeah, the movie just, it was so poignant and just incredible with fantastic acting. And the dialogue was also just amazing. And it was also just very thought provoking. And while it is about, you know, a gay guy whose parents have died, it's still just a very relatable story at the end of the day, I think too, right? Like being able to revisit your childhood and, and also just the very human desire to have your parents approve of you, right? Like it doesn't matter how old you are, like people are always wanting to hear their parents say, 
I'm proud of you, right? But yeah, and I just have to mention, everybody was fantastic in this, but this was my first time watching anything with, with Andrew Scott, who plays Adam. And yeah, he was amazing. <laughs> I wanna watch like everything he's ever been in now. And like I said, I would still recommend the book and the book really did have some just really sweet, touching moments. And it is a very thought provoking story as is the movie. And so yeah, I would definitely highly recommend you read the book as well. But when it comes to book versus movie, at the end of the day, I am going to have to say the movie wins because it took a great story, but it just turned it into something just so much more emotional and hard hitting and just, again, just so beautiful and heartbreaking. And uh, it was just incredible. <laughs> and everything about it, also the music choices were just so perfect and yeah, it's just an amazing movie. Yeah, I just also want to talk about the scene when he talks about his talks to his mom about how after she died, he had different fantasies about trips they went on together. And he mentions how at 14, they went to Disneyland and just that scene too. Oh, it was just so sweet and incredible. So yeah, I just want to say again how much I loved this movie. It was fantastic. It would definitely be in my new top 10 favorite movies of 2023. So anyway, thank you so much for watching this video, but definitely share your thoughts and it's insane that this movie didn't get a single Oscar nomination. It did get a few at the BAFTAs, but it didn't end up winning anything. But Andrew Scott is also going to be in a new Talented Mr. Ripley limited series, I think for Netflix, which comes out in April. And I covered the Talented Mr. Ripley last year. Absolutely loved it. I also watched every Ripley adaptation that has been made. So I have two Ripley related videos and I will go ahead and link to the video where I watched other Ripley movies if you have not seen that yet. But yeah, I will be making a video about the Andrew Scott Ripley once that show comes out. I am very excited. I was excited before, but now that I've seen something with Andrew Scott, like I said, I'm obsessed now <laughs> and I'm so excited to see what he does with the character of Ripley. So yeah, again, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.